Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to warmly welcome you to this stroke session. I'm Hugh Marcus from the University of Cambridge, and we've got a really exciting session today with some wonderful speakers and also two um, research presentations which were submitted, which we had great difficulty selecting from some really high quality presentations that were sent in. So we're starting off with a um, teaching talk about a really important area in neurology and stroke cerebral amyloid angiopathy, but often difficult for us to diagnose. And we've got a, a real expert on this topic, Stephen Greenberg, who is um, one of the world experts on this. Stephen is a, um, from, Stephen comes from um, Mass General Hospital and is professor of neurology at Harvard Medical School um, and director of the hemorrhagic stroke program there. So a very warm welcome to you, Stephen, and thanks so much for joining us. And, um, I really look forward to hearing your talk. Great, just, thanks very um, much, you Hugh. Thanks to- uh, Perfect. Am I working okay? <laughs> Good. Anyway, great. Um, uh, as everyone uh, I know shares the sentiment, um, uh, it's uh, nice to be together virtually. It'd be much better to be together uh, physically, and I look forward to the time when we'll be able to do that. I'm gonna talk over the next 20 minutes or so about cerebral amyloid angiopathy, uh, and I, I appreciate the opportunity to be able to present uh, work from our group and others in a disorder uh, that's not been uh, uh, well recognized until the past few decades as a clinical entity. Uh, the work that I'm gonna show is supported by grants from the uh, NIH and my disclosures at the bottom, uh, the, the uh, Alzheimer trials are not related to anything I'll be talking about, uh, but I'm also on the steering committee for the ASPIRE trial, which I will uh, mention uh, during my talk. And I just put this up um, uh, re really as a retrospective look back that uh, now when uh, uh, neurologists, uh, particularly uh, stroke specialists, see a low bar hemorrhage, uh, they'll say looks like CAA. And uh, that really wasn't true when I entered the field. And I think it's a real tribute to the growth of the field that this is now uh, well accepted by trainees and, and uh, uh, practicing neurologists as a diagnosis that you can make during life. And this is the way I'll organize my talk about uh, CAA. I'll start with a quick overview. And I think everything I'm doing will necessarily be quick and I'll be leaving out some points. I'll be happy to try to address them in the, uh, if people have questions, but I'll talk about pathogenesis and pathophysiology of amyloid angiopathy, uh, how we diagnose the living patients and I'll be presenting some unpublished approaches to um, uh, doing that that are under uh, uh, advanced development. And then I'll talk uh, briefly about some uh, major management questions. So starting with just an overview of the pathogenesis. So it's really defined as a pathologic entity. And as I say, that used to be the only way it was diagnosable was a post-mortem exam. So it's defined by the deposition of the beta amyloid peptide and leptomeningeal cortical, uh, sometimes cerebellar, small arteries, arterioles, and capillaries. Uh, it's a common pathology, so it's uh, in uh, autopsy brains, uh, it's present in a moderate to severe uh, uh, level of uh, severity in um, uh, essentially a quarter of uh, unselected brains and uh, approximately half of postmortem brains with concomitant Alzheimer pathology. So the pathology is really, if it's doing anything, it's doing it quite commonly. Um, well, the, the major way we recognize, as I mentioned, is by uh, CA-related intracerebral hemorrhage. And I think you can make the argument this is the only major stroke type without a disease-modifying therapy. Obviously, the, this is a sentence that I hope uh, will change over time, but it's uh, uh, true as of today. And uh, though I won't be talking much about non-hemorrhagic aspects of CA, I, I'll, I'll mention them uh, briefly, but uh, it's uh, clear that even in people without CA-related hemorrhage that this moderate to severe level of CA is associated with cognitive impairment independent of uh, other pathologies, in particular independent of Alzheimer pathology. Uh, these uh, projected um, trajectories came from data from the uh, uh, studies performed at Rush, the Religious Orders and Memory and Aging Project by Julie Schneider and, uh, Schneider and colleagues, uh, showing uh, that the trajectory pre-mortem uh, is uh, independently affected by severity of amyloid angiopathy uh, in the, in the post-mortem brains. And uh, the mechanisms uh, don't appear to be hemorrhagic, but uh, may, may be related to uh, ischemic brain injury. Um, and this is an overview of uh, how uh, beta amyloid uh, becomes involved with the vessels. And part of this is familiar to the Alzheimer world. So the production of uh, beta amyloid is uh, from the amyloid precursor protein through uh, secretases. 
the deposition of uh, plaques, that's the hallmark of Alzheimer's disease. Uh, then uh, various ways in which beta amyloid uh, can be cleared, either degraded uh, by uh, uh, by proteolytic uh, enzymes, uh, by efflux out uh, of the brain across the blood-brain barrier, or this uh, pathway of perivascular drainage that has come into great focus, uh, presumably not uh, only for clearing beta amyloid, but for clearing other solutes from the interstitial space along uh, the outside of uh, vessels and can either um, uh, clear out of the brain or Presumably, that's where it gets access to the outer part of vessels to uh, deposit and cause amyloid angiopathy and to cause vascular dysfunction and showing some pathology slides. Um, uh, so in the upper left is the earliest recognizable stage of amyloid angiopathy. And what you're seeing is mostly a normal uh, a vessel seen in longitudinal sections. So the uh, adventitious at the top of the screen, the uh, uh, just off uh, that slide in the upper left, the uh, lumen of the vessel would be at the bottom of the slide, just off the, that, that image. And the only part of this uh, vessel wall that's abnormal is right at the adventitia media border, where you see those rounded uh, uh, eosinophilic uh, kind of donuts. And that's the earliest uh, uh, location of amyloid deposition. Presumably the reason that it's the outer part of the vessel where amyloid deposits is that perivascular access to amyloid. And the uh, hole in the donut uh, it's referred to it by my teacher in this field, Jean-Paul Vancetel, uh, as the tombstone of the smooth muscle cell, that those were presumably loci of smooth muscle cells that have now died from uh, uh, while in direct contact with amyloid. And that leads to images like you see in the upper right now, where essentially all of the media has been replaced by amyloid. So there are essentially no living smooth muscle cells. You see the classic uh, green birefringence under polarized uh, light uh, when staining with thing, uh, with dyes like uh, Congo red, and that's the hallmark of all uh, amyloid uh, uh, peptide uh, deposits. And uh, here on the one hand, uh, the vessel wall still has integrity, so you wouldn't necessarily expect a vessel like this to bleed. On the other hand, it's lost all its normal contractile elements, as I'll, I'll come to in the next couple slides. But this is the, uh, the further pathologic degradation of the vessel wall that we think actually leads to a hemorrhage, where you see uh, this uh, concentric splitting of the vessel wall in the lower left and uh, fibrinoid necrosis where um, uh, elements of the uh, blood uh, such as fibrin can freely enter the vessel wall and lead to wall rupture and intracerebral hemorrhage. And I mentioned that loss of contractile elements. That's a really an interesting aspect of amyloid angiopathy that uh, I think there's good reason to think is quite important in terms of this other uh, ischemic side of the coin. Um, and so what you're seeing here, data from our group and others have replicated, um, showing a loss of normal uh, vasomotor reactivity in response to visual stimulation as measured using functional MRI. So the, the uh, that salmon colored control curve shows the normal response to visual stimulation increase in uh, uh, blood flow that appears as an increase in bold signal in uh, visual cortex. And in these uh, non-demented uh, CAA subjects, uh, you see both uh, reduced amplitude and also a change in the timing where there's a prolonged time to peak response that we believe reflects the loss of contractile elements in the vessel wall or other impairments in vessel physiology. Uh, this uh, presumably affects the way uh, blood flow is distributed in the brain uh, in, in response to demand, but also uh, leads to this uh, possible uh, feed forward loop as shown in the lower left. So uh, the idea is that if you lose the normal contractility, normal um, uh, vasomotor activity in uh, the uh, vessels that are uh, having the in, uh, uh, interstitial fluid uh, cleared along that perivascular space, that that will impair the clearance of fluid. So you can imagine the cycle as shown in the left where worse amyloid angiopathy leads to worse um, injury of the vessel wall, uh, decreased uh, vessel physiology compliance or reactivity. We think um, um, that those are components of the uh, vasomotion that uh, moves the interstitial uh, fluid along the perivascular space and therefore less perivascular clearance and further buildup of amyloid in the tissue causing both worse amyloid angiopathy and presumably worse Alzheimer pathology as well. Uh, and there's some evidence for this happening, at least in a transgenic mouse model. So this is work from uh, Susanna Fonvelu working with Brian Baskey at our center. And uh, the system that uh, Susanna has used is uh, to introduce contrast uh, agent, uh, uh, uses a, a laser to uh, cause a, a small uh, hole in a nearby uh, cortical vein. And then uh, as the uh, contrast that's in the vein leaks out, 
uh, watches the kinetics of the clearance of contrast along the perivascular space. And what you see on the bottom uh, graph is that uh, transgenic uh, animals, uh, this is the APPPS1 uh, mice show uh, a slower clearance of uh, the contrast material along the perivascular space in the transgenic mice compared to the wild type. And what that correlates with, as you see in the upper right, is um, uh, that there's this correlation between higher AUC, uh, which uh, reflects slower clearance, higher area under the kinetics curve, uh, correlating with uh, lower amplitude of uh, reactivity to uh, visual stimulation in the mice. So uh, this is suggestive of this idea that as you have worse physiology, you have worse clearance, uh, uh, laying the groundwork for this kind of feed forward cycle. So to uh, conclude the first part of my talk, uh, the pathogenesis is, we, is driven by progressive beta amyloid deposition in the vessel wall, leading to the loss of the normal elements of the vessel wall, vessel rupture and hemorrhage, as I'll talk about over the next few slides when I get to diagnosis, but also this impaired vascular physiology that may be responsible both for the ischemic uh, brain injuries that we see in amyloid angiopathy like microinfarcts, and also potentially to reduce clearance and this kind of feed forward mechanism for uh, worsening uh, CAA and potentially AD pathology. So turning to uh, now to diagnose a living patient, we go back to that CT scan that I showed earlier. And uh, what makes you think that that lobar hemorrhage is actually caused by amyloid angiopathy? Well, the strongest evidence now is when you see this record of other hemorrhagic lesions in that same characteristic distribution. So this is now a T2 star weighted MRI in the same patient showing not only the acute lobar hemorrhage, but also those um, uh, dark uh, lesions uh, or spots um, that reflect uh, prior deposition of paramagnetic materials. Uh, you get essentially a lifetime record of all of the paramagnetic uh, signals, all of the iron deposits. Uh, and when you see the strictly low bar pattern as shown in the arrows, uh, then that uh, meets criteria for probable amyloid angiopathies I'll talk about in a few slides. And uh, the reason that we can rely on the location of the microbleeds is this almost yin and yang distinction between where deposits occur in the two major small vessel diseases of aging. So in amyloid angiopathy, the amyloid deposition occurs, as I mentioned at the beginning, in the leptomeningeal and uh, penetrating uh, uh, small artery and arterioles in the cortex and cerebellum. That's where the amyloid is, that's where the pathology happens, and that's where the hemorrhages happen, both, both the large hemorrhages as shown here and the microbleeds as well. And that's a, a, in distinction to um, the, uh, uh, the uh, penetrating small vessel disease that gets different names in the literature. I'm using here arterial sclerosis or hypertensive microangiopathy. Uh, and um, the, the, uh, what's often thought of as the paradigmatic small vessel disease that tends to uh, affect the uh, penetrating vessels in deep gray matter. So uh, pons, thalamus, uh, and uh, 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 containment. And uh, and the uh, that's where the arterial sclerosis happens. That's where lacunar infarcts from arterial sclerosis uh, tend to happen, and it's also where uh, the classic hypertensive hemorrhages occur. So, uh, shown in the CT scans at the bottom, and putamen, thalamus, and pons, uh, and that uh, again, almost yin and yang distribution is really the hallmark for being able to diagnose amyloid angiopathy based on the distribution of hemorrhagic lesions. So you get these two kinds of patterns that. I'm calling a little colloquially on the left, uh, the probable hypertensive uh, vasculopathy pattern, and on the right, the probable amyloid angiopathy uh, pattern. So you see on the left, uh, most of the microbleeds here particularly are in uh, thalamus. I, I will point out uh, with the arrows that uh, arterial sclerosis, uh, hypertensive microangiopathy is not perfectly specific for those deep penetrating vessels and also affects uh, the low bar vessels, um, uh, as as uh, you see, so uh, uh, having some low bar microbleeds does not rule out uh, this being uh, uh, arterial sclerosis. And on the right, I'll just mention that some things that are actually uh, low bar uh, in the cortex look pretty deep uh, topographically, uh, just because of the way the cortical ribbon spins around. I'll also mention that another hallmark hemorrhagic lesion in amyloid angiopathy is this uh, cortical superficial siderosis, or when acute as shown in the flare image on the right, uh, convexity subarachnoid hemorrhage. And this appears to be pretty specific for amyloid angiopathy, that you really don't see this from uh, arterial sclerosis when you get uh, this pattern, of especially of multifocal cortical superficial siderosis. And uh, so the series of uh, findings has led to the uh, development of the uh, 
original and now the modified Boston criteria that are in use and the uh, definite and probable CA with supporting pathology categories require pathology. The ones shown in blue are probably the most commonly used uh, criteria in practice where probable amyloid angiopathy is defined by multiple strictly low bar bleeds, micro bleeds, or siderosis. Uh, the, the strictly part means we don't allow any uh, uh, hemorrhagic lesions in the, those deep penetrating territories and no other definite cause such as uh, uh, coagulopathy or head trauma. And uh, uh, this uh, validation uh, review that uh, I published with Andreas Claridimo a couple of years ago showed that in, uh, and, and all the numbers as you see are pretty small, but uh, that the um, uh, specificity seems to be quite high for uh, CA-related intracerebral hemorrhage uh, presentations. Sensitivity, pretty good, uh, not perfect. We're clearly, there's some that don't meet criteria that still have uh, CAA at, at uh, postmortem. And that's even more true if you look at people with micro bleeds uh, only uh, that, uh, or uh, who don't have a, a, an intracerebral hemorrhage where if you have that pattern of multiple strictly low bar hemorrhagic lesions, uh, it's pretty specific, but the sensitivity is quite low, especially in the population where uh, this really reflects the fact that uh, bleeding is a pretty late manifestation of amyloid angiopathy. And it's led to this uh, push uh, that we're calling the Boston Criteria 2.0. And this, as I mentioned, is uh, not published, but is an advanced state. It uh, was presented at the uh, uh, European Stroke Organization meeting uh, last year. Um, uh, and the goal here is to develop um, uh, to use additional criteria to try to improve sensitivity without compromising specificity. So, uh, and uh, summarizing a, a fairly large um, study, uh, one approach to doing this is kind of a technical fix, which is um, to be able to count uh, people with only cortical superficial siderosis that is multifocal as being in that uh, two or more strictly low bar hemorrhagic lesions. So we used to count in the modified criteria, um, uh, uh, superficial siderosis as just one lesion, but uh, in the modified, in these uh, 2.0 criteria, uh, the idea is that we will allow multiple foci to count as multiple lesions, uh, as shown in the uh, uh, image at the left. Uh, and the other addition is to begin to add what are, uh, we're calling white matter features of amyloid angiopathy. And I, again, I don't have time to go into these in detail, but what you see in the middle uh, MR image at the bottom is abundant dilated perivascular spaces in the centrum semiovalli, so that's at CSO-PVS. And what you see on the right is a multi-spot appearance of uh, the white matter hyperintensities. And so another way to now meet uh, criteria under these uh, 2.0 uh, uh, proposed criteria is uh, uh, to have a one strictly low bar hemorrhagic lesion and at least one of these white matter features. And again, summarizing what is uh, a fairly in-depth um, uh, validation study, and this is um, an international uh, study, uh, uh, and we've looked both internally at our center, but also externally at a, a team of collaborators from the International CA Association. But sort of the bottom line is that among the uh, uh, autopsy cases, um, uh, we've basically met our goal of improving sensitivity uh, relative to the um, uh, the uh, current modified Boston criteria without compromising specificity, which as you see still remains quite high and the area under the curve uh, still better for the uh, hemorrhage than non-hemorrhage presentations, but both are superior to what we could achieve in the prior uh, modified criterion. Uh, I, I hope to uh, be able to uh, publish these and uh, sort of lock them in as uh, what I believe will be improved criteria uh, in the field. So to summarize this part of my talk, uh, the, the, the uh, uh, 2.0 criteria will incorporate multiple strictly uh, low bar uh, uh, microbleeds, uh, uh, hemorrhages, and also uh, superficial siderosis, as well as these white matter markers. I won't be able to talk about uh, Edinburgh criteria developed by Rustam al Shahi Salman and his group of uh, using um, CT for uh, uh, ICH morphology is another potential marker, especially when MRI is not available. And also measures of amyloid appear to be uh, 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 other markers that can be incorporated in practice in diagnosing amyloid angiopathy. And then finally in management, and my focus will be uh, the Hamletian question of uh, whether you can or can't use antithrombotic agents. And here again, I'm gonna summarize a complicated field in just a few slides. Uh, of course, like everything in medicine, it's weighing out risk and benefit. We're pretty good at knowing the benefits of antithrombotics. That's a very well-studied field where uh, 
in particular in uh, people with atrial fibrillation. We have scores like uh, chads 2 vasc that we use uh, widely in clinical practice to weigh out that side of the scale. How much benefit is there going to be to somebody? Uh, should I be uh, uh, pushing for antithrombotic or particularly uh, uh, antiplatelet or particularly anticoagulant treatment and atrial fibrillation? Um, we're probably much less good on the risk side of the scale. And uh, the, uh, just uh, broadly speaking, hemorrhages can be intracerebral. They can be intracranial, but extracerebral or extracranial uh, bleeding throughout the rest of the body. And I'm putting the box around intracerebral, not just because this is the area that we study, but uh, because this really is the major source of long-term morbidity or mortality in people with uh, anticoagulant related hemorrhages uh, that GI bleeding can be bad. Uh, we all have seen patients who've uh, died from bad GI bleeds, but basically it's the intracerebral and to a much lesser extent, the intracranial uh, uh, extracerebral hemorrhages that are responsible for long-term disability and for mortality. So uh, of course the stakes are high in amyloid angiopathy because I, I didn't uh, specifically mention, but uh, the, the recurrence rate is much higher in uh, amyloid related hemorrhages than in uh, presumed hypertensive or non-CAA uh, hemorrhages. Uh, uh, here roughly a seven-fold difference in this uh, uh, meta-analysis uh, published by Haridimo uh, 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 and David Waring a few years ago. And uh, so, so how do we weigh those things out? Well, the first randomized data we have came from the restart study recently from uh, Rustam al-Shahi Salman and his uh, collaborators in the restart study. And here, uh, and this is not specifically in amyloid angiopathy, this is all comers with intracerebral hemorrhage, but it didn't appear to differ by subgroup. There was no increased risk of bleeding at all in people who restarted antiplatelet therapy after a hemorrhage. In fact, uh, there's even a, a trend towards uh, fewer uh, recurrent hemorrhages. And I'd love to think that uh, antiplatelet treatment actually reduces the risk of hemorrhage. I think the jury may still be out of particularly in high risk uh, groups uh, that uh, made up a component, but still a relatively small component of the restart study. But this is certainly reassuring data about restarting antiplatelets. Um, anticoagulants where the stakes are quite high, uh, there is enough equipoise uh, to generate this long list of clinical trials. And and uh, it's really an exciting situation uh, where we expect to have good data from randomized uh, uh, studies where we won't be uh, hurt by the confounding by indication, where we'll actually be able to see in randomized people whether the risk outweighs the benefit of restarting. Uh, in in uh, essentially all these studies, one of the direct oral anticoagulants, and the reason I emphasize the direct oral anticoagulants is, as is well known, I'm sure, to this group, the uh, major difference between the uh, the the, uh, uh, the DOAC or NOAC uh, agents um, versus uh, warfarin is the reduced risk of hemorrhagic stroke or intracranial hemorrhage. And uh, that uh, really makes the argument that if you're thinking about anticoagulating people with past hemorrhage, uh, there probably is no role for warfarin uh, when uh, DOACs are an option because of this lower risk of, of intracerebral hemorrhage. Another option that has come into uh, increasing use is left atrial appendage closure. And again, uh, uh, like all topics, I'm going to just gloss over it. Uh, clearly, because of the uh, lack of need for long-term anticoagulation, there's lower risk for hemorrhagic stroke among people who have left atrial appendage closure. It's not yet clear whether it's a non-inferior for preventing ischemic stroke, as you see in this uh, analysis from a few years ago. It's right at the edge of being uh, inferior to uh, anticoagulation, but uh, the devices are changing over time, and this is certainly an area to continue to pay attention to, and I think for now it's a rational option in the, uh, these situations. And I'll just mention blood pressure control, and this is sort of the uh, clear-cut uh, option because it's good for preventing, we believe, uh, both ischemic and hemorrhagic strokes in this work. Uh, this is observational data, not randomized data from Alessandra Biffy and John Roseanne a few years ago, showing that in low bar hemorrhages, but even in non-low bar hemorrhages on, on uh, even uh, I should say non-low bar hemorrhages on the left, but even low bar hemorrhages on the right, that there's a relationship between the observational blood pressures uh, observed and the uh, risk of recurrence. And this makes the argument uh, we don't have true randomized data in amyloid antiopathy, but I don't think we need it to encourage a close blood pressure control. So I'll close uh, my talk over the next couple of slides here just to say that avoiding antithrombotics unless the benefit is greater than the risk. Of course, that benefit greater than the risk is doing a lot of work there. And I think knowing that situation, but uh, the easy answer is to say that um, unless you can establish a clear benefit, there isn't, you would uh, ideally want to avoid all antithrombotics. Blood pressure controls we talked about, 
And uh, again, uh, topics that I won't be able to touch on, but avoiding heavy alcohol appears to be prudent because of epidemiologic evidence, but there's really no other clear evidence for lifestyle modifications. And I won't get to talk about uh, CAA-related inflammation as a treatable form of amyloid angiopathy and autoimmune form, but that is another management question that comes up. And I'll, I'll close here just to say that um, I, I mentioned earlier that my hope is to change that, that statement that there is no disease-modifying therapy. I think given uh, the multiple steps that we believe are a key in the progression of amyloid angiopathy, that there are ample targets for trials and uh, certainly um, ample outcome markers to use in those trials to know whether we're on the, the right track. So I am uh, optimistic uh, uh, as uh, we, uh, we are in the Alzheimer field as well, that we will have disease modifying treatments. I'll close just by uh, thanking a large number of collaborators on the studies I showed and thank you very much for your time. It's a really excellent overview. Um, do you want to stop sharing your slides and then do we get back to the main screen? Yeah, perfect. Perfect. Thanks. I was I was really excellent. We've just got only time for a, a, you know one or two very short questions, but there have been a couple. One was um, on statins use. Would you routinely give these patients statins? This is from Dr. Jeremiah from Imperial. Yeah, it's a great question, and the. the concern. Um, uh, so there are also statin studies, uh, uh, ongoing statin studies in uh, the uh, hemorrhage world and uh, data on both sides. Uh, there are uh, data to say that uh, statins may increase the risk of uh, hemorrhage such as showed up in the Sparkle study. That's not been a consistent finding. And also sort of on the other side, some data saying that outcome is improved in intracerebral hemorrhage patients who are taking statins. Um, my feeling, and based on current recommendations from organizations, is that there's not an indication for either stopping or starting statins in people with hemorrhages, uh, that the indication should be driven by their uh, need for uh, uh, statin agents based on other established indications like cardiovascular disease. My practice is to discontinue them for people who are on them just because they're sort of at a certain age and they must be good for you, but actually don't particularly have hyperlipidemia or uh, atherosclerotic disease. So if there's if, if the indication for being on them is not clear, I, I will recommend that my uh, amyloid angiopathy patients stop them because of concern it may affect uh, uh, recurrence risk, but I don't stop them when there is a clear cut indication for them. And, and can I just clarify, I mean, you covered the really interesting restart data, but your advice at the moment would be not to give antiplatelets to this group of patients. Well, so my advice is, uh, uh, not to give it when there's no clear indication. So again, I think uh, people have moved away from antiplatelets for primary prevention. The recommendation is no longer um, re recommended, uh, uh, supported, and I uh, uh, will discontinue it in people who are taking for primary prevention who have no uh, cardiovascular indication. But for people who have a clear-cut cardiovascular indication uh, and and are getting benefit, uh, I, you know, I think about it. But I think the restart data um, argue that you're not subjecting patients to high risk to do it. So when there is a clear cut indication, I, mm. I feel more comfortable with patients remaining on uh, antiplatelet monotherapy than I would have before the restart data. Okay, thank you, Stephen. I mean, we could talk about this all day because it's such an interesting subject and we haven't managed to cover it. the really in interesting inflammatory CAA, but we only gave you a very short time, I'm afraid, and it's been a wonderful talk. So thank you so much. Great, thank you.